John Lee once actually wrote two books on the establishing of mindfulness. And each one is distinctive. The first one is distinctive because of the emphasis he places on the three qualities you bring to the practice. Mindfulness, alertness, and ardency. And that's the recurring theme throughout the book. Mindfulness, he defines as keeping something in mind. And as he points out, just the practice of simply keeping something in mind doesn't guarantee anything good at all. You can keep anything in mind. Or even if you keep the body or feelings in mind, you may not necessarily get anywhere with them. There are two other qualities that need to be brought together, the, the alertness and when you're actually watching what's happening. And you keep referring back to the mind. You look at the breath, say, and, but you're also keeping track of the mind. How is the mind staying with the breath? It's the alertness that actually keeps you there, keeps you together with your object. And then he says there's ardency. He defines ardency in different ways as he goes through the book. First, it's just the effort that you put into focusing something, but it's also the effort you put on into figuring it out, analyzing it. So we're not here just accepting what's happening, we're trying to figure out what's happening. Look for the causes. Of course, this fits in with the Four Noble Truths. We're looking for the cause of suffering. We want to see what arises together with the suffering, what passes away together with the suffering, so we can know where it comes from. And this focused analysis is also a burning away of the defilement. As soon as you see the defilement for what it is, and how stupid it is, and how harmful it is, and how unnecessary it is, that's what burns it away. So as we're sitting here meditating, it's not just a matter of accepting whatever comes up, or being intimate with whatever comes up or whatever the latest phrase is that people like to use. You stick with it so you can understand it, and it does require some active movement of the mind. This ties in with the, uh, John Lee's teachings on concentration, that the role that directed thought and evaluation have in helping you to settle down. He says the evaluation there is the beginning of discernment. You take your thinking processes and you actually put them to use. You don't try to just shove them out of the mind. You figure out which thoughts are useful and which ones are not, and try to use useful kinds of thinking to stay right on target. The image he uses is of a person holding on to a post and then spinning around and around and around the post. He says as long as you hold on tight to the post, the spinning around doesn't get you dizzy. But if you try to spin around out in the middle of the field without anything to hold on to, you get dizzy and just fall right down. So there's an active quality to the meditation. And this fits in with that second book that he wrote on, The Establishing of Mindfulness, which ties mindfulness practice together with concentration practice. They're not two separate things. You hold something in mind and you're alert to what's going on. And as you analyze what's going on, you get into the first jhana. And this is not jhana light. You have to remember that John Lee, among all of John Munn's students, was said to have had the strongest powers of concentration. Stories of his being able to stop the engine of a bus getting other people to levitate through the power of his concentration. Was, his concentration was amazing. So the fact that you're thinking as part of the concentration doesn't mean the concentration is light. It means that you're bringing all of your mental powers to bear. Now, in some cases, you will let go of the thinking to get into really deeper stages of concentration. But you learn how to balance the thinking and the stillness. 
because it's the balance between the two that enables you to develop the discernment that can root out your defilements. As he said, burn them away. So it gets good to think about this as we practice. If you're having trouble settling down, ask yourself, well, what's the problem here? If you don't understand the problem, it's hard for the mind to settle down. So it's not just analyzing the breath coming in and out, it's also analyzing how are you relating to the breath? How are you thinking about the breath? What's pulling you away? Because sometimes in order to stay with the breath, you really do have to do some brush clearing. If you see that there's a particular concern or a particular obsession you've got that's pulling away from the breath, you've got to deal with it. You can't just pretend it's not there. That's where you use your focused powers of ardency to look at the defilement, whether it's greed or lust or aversion or delusion or whatever the defilement is. If it's really insistent, keeps coming back, you've got to look at it and figure out well, why does the mind like this and also look at what the drawbacks are. And the Buddha talks about this, seeing both the allure and the drawbacks so that you can figure out the escape. So as a meditator, you need lots of tools and realize you're going to bring all of your mental powers to bear on the practice. Some of the tools are simply being mindful, and once you notice that you slipped off, you come right back. No big problem. Other times you really have to look into the drawbacks. Why are you lusting after this? Or why are you greedy for that? Or why do you hate this? Or why do you dislike that? What's going on? You don't have to dig around. You don't have to dig back to your childhood. Just dig around to it. Well, why right now are you focused on that? Other times all you have to do is just look at the defilement. You relax around it and it just goes away. As John Lee says, it gets embarrassed and it leaves you. Or you're realizing you're just holding on to some tension that you don't have to hold on to. You let it go. That's one tactic. Sometimes you read that that's the big tactic, is learning how to soften up around it or how to relax around it, whatever the problem is. That works with some problems, but not with everything. This again is part of having a skill and having a full panoply of tools. Because you have to remember your defilements have a lot of tools as well. You have to learn how to be strategic. This is an aspect of the teaching that most people tend to forget. They think all you have to do is follow the Buddha's teachings and do what he tells you to do. You don't have to think too much about it, and some methods actually advise against thinking. But you end up in a blind alley. Because after all, what is this path that we're following? It's made out of the aggregates. It too is fabricated, and eventually you're going to have to get rid of those fabrications. So you're using fabrications to work against fabrications. There are a lot of paradoxical elements in the path. If you read a basic textbook on early Buddhism, it all seems very straightforward and just a little bit too simplistic. A lot of people, when they're looking for paradox, will quickly slip over the early teachings and move on to the Mahayana. I was talking one time to a young woman who was taking an introduction to Buddhist philosophy in a university nearby. And the professor was saying, okay, we're going to have to go through a little bit of the Pali Canon here, but the really interesting stuff will come in a couple weeks. And they taught the Four Noble Truths as if there was nothing paradoxical in there at all. The huge paradoxes. Becoming is part of the problem, and yet you have to create a path which is a form of becoming to get, up, get beyond it. We're trying to get beyond fabrication, but you have to fabricate the path. We're going to be using the insights of what's inconstant, stressful, and not self. And yet when you're 
developing concentration. You're trying to create a sense of something that is constant and easeful and that you've got under your control. This particularly is one of the paradoxes that, it, that John Lee liked to focus on. As he said before the Buddha, let go of everything as stressful, inconstant, and not self. He first took what was stressful and turned it into something pleasant, like as <clears throat> the way we're working with the breath right now. He took what's inconstant, this changeable mind, and made it steady, solid. And all these things that are not self, you learned how, you, the Buddha learned how to take feeling and perception, form, fabrications, consciousness, all these aggregates that are ultimately beyond our control. But he learned how to bring them under enough control to turn them into a path. He used the path as a place to stand so he could look at his other fabrications of the mind and see which things were really unskillful. When you provide yourself with a sense of ease, it's a lot easier to let go of the old habits you have of feeding on things that are that are harmful, both for yourself and for other people. So you need to work on this path, strengthen it, keep it going, so you can use it against everything that's not the path. And then you turn the path on itself, because ultimately you want to go beyond both constancy and inconstancy, stress and ease, self and not-self. And this is another theme you see often in John Lee's teachings, is that ultimately even nirvana, even right view, gets put aside. Nirvana doesn't need a right view or a wrong view. It goes beyond the views. This is something a lot of people tend to forget. They think, well, the Buddha taught right view, and that's the view of the enlightened mind. Well, the enlightened mind is something way beyond right view. There's that story in the canon where Ananda Bindika, who was a stream enter, was asked by some sectarians, what does the Buddha believe? What are his views? And here Ananda Bindika was already a stream enter, but he said, I really don't know fully what the Buddha's views are. So the perspective of the enlightened one is something that lies beyond the path. The path is our strategy, it's our tactic. This is something you find again and again and again in the John Lee's teachings. You've got to think strategically if you're going to get anywhere on the path. So this keeps throwing you back on yourself, your own powers of observation, your own ingenuity, your own honesty. Those are the qualities that are absolutely essential to the path. As the Buddha once said, bring me someone who is observant and truthful, and I'll teach that person the Dharma. But it's not just being observant and truthful. There's also that element of ingenuity. You face a problem in your meditation. The Buddha is not going to be there to whisper in your ear to tell you what to do. You find yourself facing a wall, you've got to figure out, well, maybe there's some way around the wall. Maybe I've created the wall. How can I uncreate it? How can I stop doing the things that create the wall? Because remember, look at things as actions. That's one of the most useful ways of looking at the problems in the mind. There's an activity that's causing the problem. Usually it's a repeated activity. It's repeated so often it seems solid. It's like a noise. It gets repeated again and again and again so quickly that it seems like a steady noise. But if you actually made a recording of it, you'd see that the noise comes and goes, comes and goes. That's the same with all the problems in the mind. They seem solid, but you have to remember they're activities and the results of activities which come and go. And you've got to figure out where is the mind doing this activity. That is one of the meanings of Dhamma, an inaction. So try to use your ingenuity and turn your perceptions inside out. As the Buddha said, perceptions are one of the factors that fabricates the mind. And you have to learn how to question your perceptions. 
the ones that you hold to so steadily. Maybe they're the problem. So this helps to pull you back from your perceptions and the way of mastering the aggregates, the way of letting go of the aggregates, is that you have to master them first as activities. It's only when you've mastered something you really let it go. As John Lee said, it's at that point you can let go like a wealthy person. If you haven't reached that point, you try to let go of the aggregates, you let go like a, a poor person who has nothing at all. But if you've developed all the good that can come out of the aggregates, then when you let them go, they're, they're not going to abandon you. They're there. And you, whenever you need them, you can pick them up and use them. It's like a wealthy person has lots of wealth in his house. He doesn't have to carry it around. It's there, though, for when he needs it. We've got a lot of good things in these aggregates. And it's learning how to figure out, well, what's good in here? It's not all just misery. The Buddha was able to take his aggregates and not only create states of concentration, he was able to use the aggregates to act as discernment. He was able to use the aggregates to develop all kinds of psychic powers and learn all kinds of things about the world. So there's a lot of good in here to dig out. And it's learning to figure out which is the good part, how it can be used wisely, which are the parts that you just have to cast away. That's a lot of the discernment right there. And it's a matter of discernment that the books can give us some guidance in, but we have to learn how to use our own powers of observation and our own ingenuity to make the most of what we've got. So when you look at a John Lee's teachings, these are some of the lessons you learn, and they're lessons that are really worth taking to heart.